It's great to be joined today by Sean McFate, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, which is a Washington, D.C. think tank, also author of the new novel Deep Black, a Tom Locke novel. Uh, Sean, you know, in preparing for the interview, I was reading about your background, which includes military service. It includes mercenary work. It includes work in uh, many parts of the world, which we will talk about. How do you sort of get into that line of work? Well, in my case, I kind of fell bass backwards into it. Um, like most people in that world, I came from a military background. I spent eight years as a paratrooper in the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division. And then I got out and I went to the so-called dark side. Um, and in my case, they found me. I didn't like seek it out. So how does that work? In other words, is there uh, well, t well, first, I guess we should talk about when you say they found you. What mm -hmm. types of organizations are generally included under this umbrella of mercenaries? Well, <clears throat> they would not call themselves mercenaries. They right. call themselves contractors. Um, but in my case, it was a large multinational corporation that uh, does work for the U.S. government. It's part of many would call the military industrial complex. The name of the company is called DynCorp International. Um, they do like, they're like a $4 billion a company a year. They do many things, um, from repairing airplanes to cooking food to you name it. Uh, but they have this small little wing that does things that the CIA would normally do or special forces would normally do. Uh, and that's who contacted me. And when you say things the CIA or special forces would do at the very 30,000 foot level, why would that type of work be contracted out to begin with? In other words, why are these types of organizations even in existence as opposed to just doing these actions and activities internally? Well, most people would be surprised by how much of our foreign policy is outsourced. Um, in, in some ways, you know, like I say, things like the CIA or special forces, what I was doing and I was mostly in Africa. I was doing arms deals. I was doing uh, taking care of warlords. I was building small armies for U.S. interest. In one case, even helped prevent a genocide in Rwanda and Burundi region. These are things that traditionally the CIA would have done. The reason why it's being outsourced now is for a few reasons. One is that um, when you really want something done with a zero footprint operation, you don't go to the CIA, you don't go to the Pentagon. You could, but you can also go to the pen, you also go to uh, the private sector because they give you great plausible deniability. Meaning that if something goes wrong, if the mission is too politically risky, uh, and you don't want your SEAL team guys uh, paraded on television as prisoners of war, then you hire contractors because then you could say, well, we don't know who really they were. Uh, it gives you a new layer of plausible deniability, which matters a great deal in an information age. Does that plausible deniability come at a cost in the sense that an operation carried out by a group like the one you worked for would be sort of apples to apples more expensive than the government handling it internally? Well, actually, contractors are cheaper than the government, and they can actually be better than the government at what they do. We always think that contractors are not good at what they do. They they overcharge. Yeah, they do overcharge. Um, but they can actually be very effective. However, you know, I think the, the bigger point is um, when you when you outsource to, to companies, you don't really also know what you're getting. There's a lot of problems with this. Most people think that you're getting like ex guys like myself, US Army guys. Um, you're not. I was working alongside with people from, you know, Salvador, Philippines, Mexico. In some ways, the globalization of force is like the globalization of a T-shirt. Hmm. It comes cheaper if it's come from a sort of so-called developing nation. Um, and so we have a we're creating unintentionally. The U.S. has created this sort of global market for private military labor that's sloshing around the world right now. So you've addressed and you did a very interesting Reddit AMA. You've been interviewed a number of times and and also through the fictionalization of your career in the Tom Locke novel series, you've addressed areas in which uh, there are many misconceptions when it comes to this type of work, when it comes to concerns, right? I, I, at the same way that the plausible deniability of using these types of organizations is a good thing for the government, 
Uh, yeah. Is it also possibly or or in practice providing cover for really horrible things that are being done? I mean, the risks of this are much worse than people think. First of all, by using contractors, you know, contractors do not count as boots on the ground and they don't count as casualties. <laughs> um, you know, so that's why you've seen contractors rise for both Republican and Democratic White Houses. Um, this is so much so that like in the Iraq war, we had a one to one ratio for every contractor. There was a troop that's, you know, 50 percent troops, 50 percent contractors in World War Two is only 10 percent contractors. And when I talked to, and recently, as you may or may not know, the former founder of Blackwater, Eric Prince, proposed a new strategy for Afghanistan where we replace all troops in Afghanistan with mercenaries. Right. Uh, you know, which is ridiculous. We're getting to the point now where contracting is becoming the American way of war. And what this does is it circumvents, you know, democratic accountability armed forces because contractors do not answer to anybody except for who holds the contract. And more importantly, is that others are now imitating this model. We have mercenaries all over the world who used who were former Iraq and Afghanistan contractors are now looking for the next paycheck. This is a very dangerous development. So we, we heard a little bit about the, the sort of legal upside for the U.S. government to using these types of contractors. What yeah. about law within the countries that the contractors operate? I mean, what what law applies in those countries since they don't count as boots on the ground? I'm guessing that they are not operating within what you would consider a theater of war or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Well, we don't know is the answer. Um, so, in you know, there is most of these I mean, mercenaries, armed contractors go to conflict markets where rule of law is already very weak. These are civil wars essentially. Um, so, for example, in 2007, 10 years ago, a bunch of Blackwater mercenaries, contractors killed 17 innocent Iraqis in a traffic circle in Baghdad called Nisor Square. This became one of the low points of the Iraq war. It was probably it may have been the, the worst war crime, uh, per, you know, done in the Iraq war by U.S. forces. And I'm including them as U.S. forces. So there was a U.S. contract. Um, you know, what what happened to them after they murdered civilians? Well, they got an airplane and they went home. That's all that happened to them. They weren't tried in Iraq. They weren't really they weren't tried in America until years later in a very controversial trial. Um, and th this is the problem for the future. If if we had a mercenary working under the U.S. government in Iraq from a place like well, I'll just pick on Guatemala and that soldier's counterinsurgency techniques are different than ours. And he massacres and, you know, a whole family in Afghanistan. Where does he go on trial? Is it in America? Is it in Afghanistan? Is it, you know, from his home country or is it nowhere? We still don't know. So this is the problem is that there is no real rule of law. International laws really don't apply very well. And at the end of the day, who's going to arrest mercenaries? Mercenaries will just shoot your law enforcement. When it comes to some of the other stereotypes that exist about these types of contractors, can you address number one? how the mortality rate compares for contractors versus official service members. I'm guessing the answer varies on where you're talking about. Number yeah. two, there's this idea that the pay is just exorbitantly high for contractors. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, maybe. Sure. So, you know, I, there's a lot of myths about mercenaries. There are modern mercenaries. It's coming back after a couple of centuries of being dormant. And um, it changes the way war is waged. And I try to get at the truth using fiction because that way I can sort of tell the secret of world of mercenaries without getting sued to death, which is my my agent initially said would happen to me. Um, and the novel story I actually started as a memoir and I turned it to fiction. And there's a lot of myths. One is that contractors make a lot of money. They do not. Um, they make, you know, like when I was in this world, I was making probably double my army salary, which is not a whole lot. And if you're from uh, a country, like a, you know, a donor, or de like a developing country, you kind of get lower rates even for doing the same job, which is unfair. Um, you also get killed. <laughs> um, people die a lot. In the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, at, towards the end, a lot more contractors were getting killed than actual soldiers were. 
um, and the mortality rate is much higher. Uh, and they go to where the fighting is. Um, there's other myths too. Um, you know, most a big myth is that when the U.S. hires private military contractors, those contractors are all former American veterans. They are not. Only a minority of them are Americans. Most of them come from all over the world, and they're fighting American wars, but they're not American themselves. There's all sorts of really weird myths out there. I recently interviewed a trial attorney, Mike Papantonio, who has been able to sort of get around confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements from his legal work by fictionalizing them into he just put yeah. out the second of a series of novels. Um, so it sounds like you're sort of in a similar situation, right, where when we look yeah. at the Tom Locke novel series, it is fiction. But generally speaking, this is based on your personal experience. Yeah. So the Tom Locke novel series began as a memoir of stuff I was doing in Africa as a, as a private military contractor, some would say mercenary. Um, we changed it to fiction, so to, for obvious protection. But those books, uh, they, they kind of read, they're international thrillers. Um, they read like a good Brad Thor or Dan Silva novel, but they're, a lot of them are as reality. Uh, in the same way, sort of like John le Carre, the novelist, pulled back the, the, the curtain on what was really going on in the Cold War with this secret war of KGB versus CIA and MI6. He was a former MI6, which is like the British CIA officer writing about that world as a novelist. I'm doing the same thing now as a former private military contractor, a mercenary, showing people what the what modern warfare really looks like. Who, you know, who are these mercenaries? Why are they fighting? What are they what are they like? And what do they hope to achieve? All that stuff comes out. Uh, and so the second book just came out. It's called Deep Black. And this takes with this takes place inside of the ISIS caliphate. Uh, based on actual ground reports and sourcing there that I have. Yeah, John Le Carre, one of my favorite authors. I've read a couple dozen of his books, I would say, just about all of them, really. Uh, we've been yeah. speaking with Sean McFate, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, a Washington, D.C. think tank. As he mentioned, the latest book is Deep Black, a Tom Locke novel. Sean, great to speak to you, and I appreciate you sharing your uh, stories today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on your show.